Oh, come on. Hey, all that working out, you can't open a water bottle? Oh, come on. What's he? Sir, I think you got the wrong workout program. Are you kidding? He's still after us? You ought to ask for help. Come on, give us oh. some money. Well, last night we showed you a young fan who was attempting to eat a hot dog. This guy's just trying to get the peanut shell opened up. <laughs> yeah, Mom, come on. Buy him the ones in the jar that are already shelled. <laughs> Good morning, good morning Avenue. I kind of wanted to show the little Texas fan during the game last week about the struggle being real. I've started off bad. I'm sorry. Welcome to the Avenue. I'm so glad that you are with us today. If you're here in the room, we appreciate that. Those of you on the porch, Ennis Campus, uh, I walked around the campus, uh, the new building. They framed it out. You can see what it's going to look like. It's going to be incredible. So excited about you guys getting in that new space. Online, we appreciate you being here. We have started a new series called The Struggle is Real. And we're going to be going through the book of James for the next few months. And we're going to attack the book of James one verse at a time. But I'd appreciate if you don't tell other church people that because they don't think we use the Bible. And so we don't want them to know. But we are going verse by verse through the book of James. And James is probably the first letter that was written to the church. Uh, Jesus had just died, been resurrected, and about 10 years after this, James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, they got together, the Jewish people tried to stop this movement. They stoned Stephen, they put him to death, and then the church fled to all areas. They got away because the goal was to find them all, round them up, and kill them to stop this new movement, this followers of Jesus, followers of the way is what they were called. And so James stayed in Jerusalem along with Peter. He became the head of that church, and he was writing letters to people all around to say, hey, this is how you live the Christian life. This is what the Christian life looks like. We know that you're in a rough place. And listen, I understand, if you're not struggling living the Christian life, you're not doing it right, because the Christian life is truly a struggle to live the way that Jesus lived. So today, we're going to start that series and uh, talking about struggling and the struggle's real. One thing we're doing here at our campus, the Ennis campus, is we're going to ask you that once the message starts, if you need to get up and leave, that's perfectly understandable. I, I have to get up and leave a lot. When you get up, if you have to get up and leave, we're going to ask you not to re-enter the building. In Ennis, we're going to ask you to stay in the back. Here, we just don't want you to come back in the building uh, for several reasons. One, security. Two, I have enough ADD that that's so distracting, I just don't know what to tell you. And then anytime somebody opens the back door to come in, I lose the last eight rows. Because everybody is like me, they all turn around and see what's going on. Now, I understand wanting to be distracted. I'm not that good a speaker. Uh, anything that moves, you know, we're going to look at. But we're going to ask you to do that. And I know for some of you, that's going to be a hard thing. But we're just going to ask you, please, once the message starts, we're going to ask you to stay in the room so I can have everybody's attention as best I can. So if you would help me with that, I'd appreciate it. Today, we're going to start in James, and we're going to get through one whole verse. We're going to do James 1-1 because the Cowboys play at noon, and we got to get out of here. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's why I get in trouble. I say stupid things trying to be funny. But we are going to get out of here quick because the Cowboys play at noon. Anyway, all that to tell you. <laughs> James 1-1. He starts out and he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Now, once again, I want to set the, the course that we're going to be going through for the next few months. And so I want you, first of all, to know who James is and why he has authority to write, and about his experience in, in meeting Jesus. And then I want to tell you who it was to, like we said, the, the people that were dispersed out throughout the entire known land and were followers of Jesus. And then I'm going to share with you why he wrote this letter and how important it was. So let's start with James. First of all, who is James? James is the half-brother of Jesus. He's the half-brother of Jesus. Now, if I was writing the letter and I was the half-brother of Jesus, in my pride, I'd probably point that out. Oh, by the way, I'm the half-brother of Jesus. You should listen to me. But James, of course, following the lead of Jesus, knows humility. Now, it's interesting. There's a lot of Jameses in the New Testament. There's a lot of people named James uh, during this time. But he doesn't even have to say James, the son of, at all, because he's that well-known. Everyone knows he's the brother of Jesus. So he doesn't even say it 
because everybody already knows it. Now, those of you that grew up in the Catholic tradition, raise your hand real quick. Raise your hand if you grew up in the Catholic tradition. I know half of Anna's hands are up right now, even though I can't see you. I understand that. And growing up in the Catholic tradition, when I say he's the half-brother of Jesus, that causes problems because we were taught growing up. By the way, peace be with you. Uh, <clears throat> that's an inside joke for Catholics. If you didn't get it, it's okay. Anyway, when we were growing up, we learned what about Mary? She was a virgin, of course, when she had Jesus. But then the Catholic Church taught us that she remained a virgin from that time on. That had been a hard life for Joseph, I'm just saying. But that's what the church kind of taught, that she never stopped being a virgin. In fact, they took it to the point that even her mother was a virgin. And so, you know, sex didn't get anywhere around Mary because, you know, in the early days, that, that, was, that was just all sin. And so that's what we were taught. We were taught that this James was either a cousin of Jesus, and they just used the word that was close, or that Joseph had a family before, and this was a stepbrother. But there's no indication from the word of God or tradition that Joseph wasn't just a younger man that married Mary that was his first marriage. So there's no proof of that. So for us, just know that, that Jesus had a big family. Jesus came from a big family. He had brothers, he had sisters. Uh, and so after the virgin birth, after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph had a normal life and had children. And these were the brothers, half brothers and sisters of Jesus. Now, we don't know a lot about his family. We don't know a lot about his early years. In fact, the Bible says he was born of a virgin. We know at age 12, his parents left him in the temple. And then according to Luke 2.52, it says he grew in wisdom, stature, and favor among men and with God. But that's about it. But understand, this family from the very beginning knew about Jesus. They lived with Jesus every day. Can you imagine that kind of pressure, being the little brother of Jesus? I mean, can you imagine mom coming to you and saying, James, why can't you be more like Jesus? <laughs> Poor James. He's like, mom, how? He's perfect. And so he grew up. Now, here's the thing about growing up, and this is the biggest point I want you to hear today. Jesus' family did not believe in him. Do you hear me? Jesus' family understood Mary was told that he was going to be the Messiah. She knew that she gave birth miraculously. The family, of course, had heard the story. So they expected Jesus to be a Messiah, but they did not understand that he was God in the flesh. Now, they watched him, and of course, he must have lived a perfect life, because if he hadn't have, one of the family would have told, right? Let's be honest. Our family tells every secret. Anytime people are impressed with us, all you got to do is bring them home for just one visit, and the family tells them every embarrassing thing you've ever done in your life. And, and so they knew Jesus was special, but James did not believe in Jesus. And I think that's important for us as a church because, yes, we're made up of people who follow Jesus, but we're also open to invite those who haven't followed him yet. We believe in welcoming everyone in here, no matter where you are in your journey. And I believe there are some people in here today, I know there are people listening online, that just don't believe everything we say about Jesus. They do not believe, many of them may not even believe in God. Some of you may be here today and you've heard us talk about Jesus and you think, you know, a lot of that's a myth, or that's just kind of a crutch. Religion's a crutch for people who can't handle it on their own. And so you have all of these things and all these ideas, and you think, well, I shouldn't be in church. Well, no, you should be. There were people following Jesus during the time he walked on the earth did, did not believe everything he was saying. And so today, when we tell you that a man lived, and he died, and he came back to life, and you're like, eh, that's okay. Keep coming back. Keep listening. James did. Now, James may have even taken it further than you, because when Jesus started his earthly ministry, he started going all over the area that he grew up in, and he was doing these miraculous things. He had turned water into wine. He had healed sick people. Uh, he had done some incredible things, but he was saying some things that bothered his family. In fact, this is when he was choosing his disciples. He told them to follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He explained that he was the son of God. He explained that he was God in the flesh. He had said things like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. I was sent from God to redeem mankind and to take away their sin. All of these things were bothering his family. 
He was saying these things and the Pharisees and the religious leaders were hearing these things and they were getting upset with Jesus and people were starting to murmur against Jesus. Who does he think he is? He's claiming to be God. That's blasphemy. That's blasphemy that deserves death. So it says in Mark, we read that his family starts hearing all of these things. And it says when his family heard about this, they left their home to take charge of him. They went to Capernaum where he had set up, which is about a day's journey from Nazareth. It says, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him and listen to what they said. For they said, he is out of his mind. So James thought his brother was crazy. James thought his brother had taken it too far. Now you can understand being the half brother of Jesus. Can you imagine trying to wrap your mind around your brother's God? That'd be a stretch, right? You check his Facebook status and it says, hey, I'm God. And you're like, whoa. I knew he had a high self-esteem, but he's reaching on that one. And then all of a sudden, the newspapers start picking up stories about him. And he's doing these incredible things. And, and he's doing all of these miracles. But he keeps saying, I am the creator of man. I, I am the son of God. I am God in the flesh. He's saying these things. And listen, understand, Jesus said these things. There's a lot of people that want to tell you today that Jesus never claimed to be God, and that's a misunderstanding of the Bible. If they say Jesus never claimed to be God, he always said he was just the son of God, that is not what the Bible says at all. In fact, all through the Bible, Jesus makes it very clear, I have come from God, I am God. John wrote, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He never never backed away from that. One day they asked him, do you think you're God? And he said... I am, which is the personal name of God. They picked up stones at that moment and wanted to kill him. Jesus was put to death because he claimed to be God in the flesh. Know that, first of all. So James thought, man, he has lost it. He has lost it. We need to go get him. We need to bring him home. We need to give him some tea. We need to settle him down. He's just lost his mind. And so they go to get him, and it says... His mother and brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. They're out there looking for you. And so you need to know what they thought. Jesus comes back into the area of Nazareth, and he begins to do miracles, and he begins to talk about the fact that he is the Messiah, that he's the Son of God. And as he is talking about it, the people in the community that watched him grow up, they all looked and said, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Aren't his brothers, James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, aren't they with us? Aren't his sisters here with us? When they took offense. So Jesus replies, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. So the people closest to Jesus did not believe. They just didn't. That's okay. It's okay for you in your journey to be at a point that you just don't believe. We want to encourage you to continue coming, continue your journey, continue listening, continue seeking. That's what James did. He stayed in the distance. He followed his brother, but he didn't believe. In fact, his brothers even called him out. In John 7, it tells the story. There's a big festival. And Jesus' brother said to him, hey, why don't you leave Galilee and go down to Judea? There your disciples can see your works, and no one wants to be a public figure hides. So why don't you get out there? In other words, they're kind of saying, hey, if you're such a big deal, prove it. You've ever had somebody, you reach a point, you're like, you think you can do it? Go do it. Well, that's what they said. The next verse says, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. So his family followed him at a distance. They saw the things that were going on. As he went into Jerusalem for that last time, his family went with him because it was a strict Jewish family. They went down for the Passover. His mother was there. Jesus was teaching, and that's when it reached that pinnacle point, and the Pharisees had had enough of it, and so they made a plan to get rid of Jesus, and Judas betrayed Jesus And they went and they took him and they tried him illegally and they put him and they beat him with a cat of nine tails and they they tortured him and they did all of these things. And then they led him out carrying a cross to a hill where they nailed him to the cross. His family experienced that. 
Can you imagine Mary? She had given birth to this beautiful baby boy. She had held this boy in her arms, and now she's watching him, and because he claimed to be God, they're going to put him to death. She watched the whole thing. Her family was there. You know they supported her. You know they encouraged her, tried to help her get through this horrible time in her life, her firstborn son being put to death. She knows he's done nothing wrong. He's never sinned in the entire time she's known him. He just keeps saying he's God. I wish he would have stopped saying that. And he'd still be here. They buried him. They put him in a grave. They rolled a stone. And they said goodbye. As they're mourning, though, three days later, something incredible happens. Something that changed the course of history. Something that changed the lives of billions of people. Something that changed the world as we know it. Because for the first time ever, a man died without sin to cover up sin. And three days later, under his own power, he walked out of the grave. And when he walked out of the grave, everything changed. Everything became different. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, Then he appeared to James, then to all the disciples. This unbelievable, magnificent, unprecedented thing happened right then. A man came back to life. Unbelievable. Can you imagine? Jesus knocked on the door and James answered it. And Jesus looked at him and said, I told you I was God. I wonder what James did at that moment. Did he fall on his knees? Did he wrap his arms around him? Did he cry tears of joy? Did he apologize for doubting? What did James do? I don't know exactly what he did, but I know something happened in the life of James that day. I know something happened, and it flipped a switch in him, and he was no longer a wishy-washy follower of this Jesus. He was no longer wondering, is Jesus or is he not the Son of God? That in that moment, he became the Savior of James. James knew him. Folks, that's why the church exists. This letter was written in 40. The other letters were written from about 40 to about 90 to 110. And we compiled those and we turned it into a holy manuscript, the Bible. But the Bible as we know it didn't come about to 325 A.D. The world was turned upside down because the first witnesses of the resurrection shared the gospel. The first witnesses saw Jesus die on a cross and come back to life. And they became bold and they began to exclaim this and they began to teach it. James became a leader in the church. James became one of the best spokesmen for God. He began to tell everyone, Jesus was alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus died for your sins. All you have to do is follow him and find eternal life. James preached this message. In fact, he preached it so much that a mob formed and told him, you need to recant that message. You need to recant that message right now. They dragged him out to the Temple Mount, which was a, a wall high above the streets of Jerusalem. They gave him another chance. You recant and we'll let you live. He refused. You see, he knew who Jesus was. He grew up with Jesus. He watched Jesus. He doubted Jesus, but when Jesus defeated the grave, he had no doubt this is the Messiah, the Son of God. He wouldn't. It says they threw him down, and he hit the ground, but he didn't die. They asked him to recant again, and he was praying for the mob that was actually killing him. The tradition goes that someone picked up a stick nearby and finished the job by bashing his head in. So James went to be with Jesus. You know who picked up the mantle? You know who became the leader of the church next? His brother Judas. Now that's a bad name for a brother of Jesus, let me just say quickly. Like, my name's Judas. And like, oh yeah, we know you. No, no, I'm not that one. Just call me Jude. And so he goes by the name of Jude in the Bible. But what a testimony. Listen, when the leader of the church is murdered, there's not a lot of people standing in line for the job. But Jude watched Jesus. He saw him grow up. He doubted him. 
But when Jesus came back alive, he had no doubt that this Jesus, my half-brother, is my Messiah. He's my Savior. He is the God of the universe. And everything he said was true. Now, it's my hope for you that this is where you come in this journey. It is my hope for you that you listen and you watch and you see the community we've built around you and you see how we love one another and you see how we love our community and how we serve and all of those things. And we hope that you're attracted to that. But then we want you to meet Jesus. And, and while you're walking that walk, you can doubt, you can wonder, you can think, you can wonder if it's true that Jesus came back to life. Is it a myth? Is it, what is it? But I hope you come to the same point that James came to. My half-brother is the son of God, and he died for my sins. If James can believe, if Jude can believe, if Mary can believe, if those first disciples could believe, and listen, they died for it. Now, people will die for a lie if they don't know it's a lie. But nobody dies for a lie if they know it. If James knew that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body, if James knew that they had hid him somewhere and he was really dead, he would have recanted. But James saw living Christ. Today, I hope you find your place in this journey and you understand that we believe this not because the Bible says it, but because the first witnesses proclaimed it and we are following their lead. Jesus is real. Because of that, James began to write. Now, he wrote to these Christians that were struggling. He wrote to these Christians that were hurting. They had fled their homes. They had left their work, and they were tracking them down. In fact, a man named Saul, who later becomes Paul, is set with, I'm going to track them down, drag them back, and we're going to put them to death. They were struggling in their faith. They were struggling in their life. And so James began to write to them and say, hey, this is how you live in this world. This is how you live among these pagans. This is how you live that you show others the truth of God. And folks, don't, don't let me downplay the fact that I understand the Christian life is a struggle. But there's something going on in the Christian life that the book of James speaks into and something all of us need to understand and all of us need to look at. See, the thing that's going to destroy the church is not the people on the outside looking in. I mean, the culture of Christianity, we have always been in cultures that hated us. And some of you, for the first time in your life, you're watching that. I mean, you've seen that we make a hero out of a football player who kneels during the national anthem. But when another football player puts on his Twitter that kids should take their Bibles to church, they shun him. We live in a time that because Chick-fil-A speaks about Christian values, they're seen as a hate organization because focused family focuses on what a family is supposed to be according to the word of God they're seen as a hate organization and Christians are mocked and ridiculed and put down but ladies and gentlemen we have no fear that we will fall from the outside the way we'll fail is from the inside and James is writing to those of you who say you're followers who have stepped across that line and say okay I believe He's saying, hey, okay, you have faith, but let me tell you what happens when you have faith. When you have faith, your life changes. You don't go back to those old habits. You don't go back to those old ways. You live different because you say you've had faith in God. And so let me tell you how you're to walk now that you believe. Now remember, there's no judgment for those outside the church. There's nothing they're doing that's going to... You know, cause us to judge them. Whatever's in their life, the only thing we want them to know is Jesus is love and Jesus is real and Jesus accepts. But once you cross the line of faith, something has to change in your life. We're not seeing a lot of that. There's a lot of people that claim the faith, but they look no different than the world around them. And I've heard the excuses. I've heard People say, you know, everybody sins. That's not a big deal. Everybody does it. Oh, you just understand. God loves everybody. And so, yeah, there's a sin in my life. And I know the Bible says 
that, that we're not supposed to have sex before marriage. But everybody does. I know the Bible says that we're not supposed to cheat, but man, it's high school. God doesn't care. I know God says that we're not to lust, that so we shouldn't look at pornography according to the Bible, but everybody does it. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal to live together. We're just trying it out. It's not a big deal to divorce. God wants us to be happy. Now, all of these things, I understand there's a struggle. But if it's not a big deal, why did Jesus die? If it's not a big deal to God, wouldn't he have come up with another way? If, if God just winked at sin, would Jesus really have to have been tortured and hung on a cross and go into a grave to bring us back to life? Would that have happened if sin wasn't a big deal? No. So as a church, we need to reclaim what the word of God says and we need to live it. We need to live it. James puts it this way. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you claim to have faith but have no deeds? Then he says, can such a faith save them? Now, once again, do not miss here. Deeds do not get us to heaven. We're not based on works. Jesus loves us as much now as he ever will. We don't have to work to gain his acceptance at all. That's not what James is saying. <clears throat> He's been misunderstood. What James is saying is, if you truly have faith, deeds follow. Deeds don't produce a faith. Faith produces deeds. And so if you're a Christian today and you've stepped across that line, things need to be different in your life. First of all, you need to have accepted Christ and you need to say, I believe and ask him to forgive our sins. And then the Bible's clear. That very next step is to be biblically baptized. And people are like, oh, that's not really a big deal. I did that when I was a kid. No, 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 no. You got wet when you were a kid. What happened after salvation is baptism. And then he wants you to be reading the word of God and praying, not just by yourself alone, but in community. And he's made you to be in community. That's why we started Fight Club. That's why we have life groups. <clears throat> That's why we have community service groups, because we have to do this together. And so as a Christian, if you're out there alone, you're not following up. Your faith has not produced deeds that where you're in community with others. And then you're serving. The Bible says inside the church, loving one another, and outside the church for a community that is hurting. We need to be out there for the homeless. We need to be out there for the downtrodden. We need to be out there <clears throat> for the rich and out. We need to be serving our community to show them the message of Jesus saves. We need to be serving. We need to be giving to our church so our church can continue to reach more and more and more. And you've heard me say, how big does this church want to be? We want to stop growing when the last person in Ellis County accepts Jesus. But until then, we're not big enough. You need to be inviting. <clears throat> That's why we've tried to create an atmosphere that whoever you want to bring, I mean, the most lost person you know that can't say one sentence without using four cuss words, he'll fit in real with your pastor. He'll fit there. He'll be perfect. That person you think will never darken the doors. You invite them in, but you're inviting, inviting, inviting. You're not afraid of what they think. But let me tell you, let me call you out very, very quickly. If your life looks no different than theirs and you invite them to church, you better believe they're going to question you. I get it. That's what James is saying. He puts it this way. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, you tell me you have faith, but if your life doesn't show it, do you? Do you? Now hear me, I understand the struggle. And we're going to be talking about that. The struggle's real. 
And God does love you. And God forgives sin, but sin is serious to him. It's not a joke. You don't wink at it. You don't say everybody does it. You try to live your life as best you can, pleasing and honorable to him. And then you do these things that we've discussed. Deeds don't save you. Faith saves you. But the question is, do you really have faith if there's no action? I'll leave you with that. Would you bow with me? God, we ask you today to help our unbelief. God, we want to follow you, but the struggle's real. And there's so much that goes on. There's so many questions and so many things in our lives. God, I pray that you'll begin to answer those questions. That we'll see you for who you are and we'll fall in love with you all over again. And God, we pray that we'll have the faith that leads to action. And that we live a life honoring you and the sacrifice that you made. God, you said that anyone who does your will is your brother and sister. God, we all want to be your little brothers and sisters. Help us to do your will. In Jesus' name. It's been a great start to our new series, Struggle is Real. So glad that you've joined us. Um, I heard an author say recently uh, that when, when life is a struggle, when life is tough, we often ask God, why? You know, why are these things happening? And, and instead of uh, providing answers, oftentimes God provides people. He provides friends. Instead of saying, this is why, he, he gives us people to come alongside of us and encourage us and walk with us uh, in the, the journey and in the struggle of life. And so uh, if you're a person today, whether you're struggling today or not, um, we believe that doing life, to, to, doing life alone is not the way it's meant, meant to be. Uh, doing life alone is not the way that God has created us. And if tomorrow, if things take a turn for the worse and the, the struggle does become real tomorrow, uh, we believe it's important for you to have people around you who will be with you, to walk with you, to encourage you, to support you. And so if you are that person that needs people around you, needs uh, that community and that support, uh, today we have several of our life groups um, set up out across from Family Check-In. Uh, people who want to invite you into their lives, uh, provide support, provide uh, encouragement, and just uh, in this journey, in the struggles, uh, these people want to walk with you. And so uh, give those uh, folks a visit right across from Family Check-In. There's some tables set up there. And we want to invite you next Saturday night um, we have, of course, next weekend we have services throughout the weekend as normal. But next Saturday night we have a special ceremony to ordain Melissa Lance. Melissa Lance has, uh, <laughs> Melissa Lance has served our church for nearly 30 years faithfully uh, lead, leading families and, and children um, and just been an incredible minister of the gospel for nearly 30 years. And next week as a church, we get to recognize her through an ordination service of uh, ordaining and, and setting apart and consecrating Melissa's work here and her continued work in the future of just representing what it means to be a godly woman, a, a godly leader, uh, and a minister of the gospel. And so next Saturday night at 6 p.m., we inv invite you to a, a special ceremony just for Melissa, just to, to uh, uh, believe in her and, and to walk with her and to encourage her in the work that she's done for nearly 30 years and will continue to do here in our community. So hope to see you next weekend for part two of The Struggle is Real and Melissa's ordination service. You guys have a great week. Take care. Um, go Cowboys, right?